thanks very much. Uh, great to be here. Um, it is a great uh, honour and a privilege to uh, have a chance to present the, uh, the winners of the Economist Nielsen Data Visualis Visualisation Challenge for 2012. Uh, the winners uh, receive a cheque for $10,000 and uh, the recognition of everyone in the room as to the great work they've done. Um, let me give uh, a very, very brief uh, bit of background to uh, the challenge. At Nielsen, we measure what people watch and what people buy in 101 countries. And as a result of that, we accumulate uh, every minute of every day an enormous amount of uh, insights and information about consumers and about their behaviour. But in our view, big data is actually a description of the problem rather than the solution. The solution has to be about unlocking that data to help consumers and researchers, academics, intellectuals, governments, privacy advocates, and businesses make better decisions. And for that reason, uh, we launched the challenge and uh, we're very excited uh, with the results. We received over 4,000 uh, submissions and uh, those 4,000 submissions came from over 100 countries. We had a, a panel, an esteemed panel of judges which consisted of Matt Anchin from Nielsen, uh, Aaron Coblin from uh, Google and Robin Bu from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, as a result of an exhaustive process, uh, we are very, very proud and pleased to announce uh, two winners, and they're actually a husband and wife team, uh, Bogdan and Stephanie Yamkovenko. So I'd like you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage, and I'll give them the check for $10,000. Now, um, Bogdan, I hope you won't be offended. I'm not going to make any uh, judgments about who manages the household finances, but I will, I will give this to Stephanie. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So uh, what we're going to do for a few minutes is just have uh, Stephanie and Bogdan walk us through uh, their winning entry and explain the process they went through and some of the... Uh, uh, some of the insights they developed and what they think it, it uh, augurs for the future. Right, are we on the screen? <laughs> well, before the thing comes up, I, I guess I would say um, that in any uh, uh, modeling situation, in any uh, data analysis, which is sort of my interest, uh, it's very important to look at uh, not just what's in the data set, but perhaps look at a bigger picture and see what other variables may be uh, important in the uh, in the phenomenon that you're trying to explain. And so we sort of approach this uh, from that standpoint by looking at the D Nielsen data and then supplementing it with um, some other metrics, and one of them being um, the uh, index of uh, press freedom in different countries, which is supplied by uh, Reporters Without Borders. And uh, so I'll, I'll let Stephanie actually walk us, well, talk a little bit about the beginning, and then I'll, I'll add. Yeah, so what we found is that the Consumer Confidence Index is an index that tells how, people, tells how confident people are in their economy. And we found that actually the consumer confidence increased as the press freedom decreased. And so the thing that we kind of drew from that is that when the government controls the information flow, they can paint a very rosy picture of their economy and they can let people think that everything's okay when it might be okay or it might not. And when we found that relationship, we decided to do a little bit more in-depth analysis. And so I'll go back with Bogdan. Right, so just a very basic model is looking at uh, consumer confidence index as, a, uh, as an outcome we're trying to explain. And so unemployment is, obvious, is an obvious variable, just like that debt would be. Um, and in, uh, in this case, as we supplemented that with press freedom, you're looking at explaining about 40% of the variance in, in the uh, outcome. Um, and actually, if you look at uh, this in more detail, um, unemployment and press freedom contribute about a half and half. So uh, both are pretty important in this case. And, though, and so um, after that, we decided to look some more at uh, the similarities and differences between the uh, countries. And so on this next slide, we're looking at, 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 at the result of uh, clustering uh, methodology, which essentially tells you that countries with really um, with a, a pretty high consumer confidence index all have a very um, a low rating of, of uh, press freedom. And so press freedom is measured on a scale where high values are actually bad and low and negative values are actually good. And so you can see that 
the countries uh, like Ireland, Portugal, and Greece um, have a very, very uh, low consumer confidence index, but also have a very high uh, um, press freedom. And so then if you take this a step further, you could see uh, how press freedom uh, relationship holds in different country in different regions, um, and so this this is essentially a methodology that that allows you to account for differences in regions and differences in and essentially the groupings of countries, and this shows an even more interesting uh, relationship where um, the press freedom as press freedom gets worse, uh, the consumer confidence increases in all regions except for Europe, and. Um, that, that one sort of baffled me for a while, and um, I'm, I'm still not sure what's really going on. Part of this was a relatively small sample set, so there may be um, some issues about in the, de in the density of the data. But um, ultimately, um, you know, a more interesting explanation would be that things are so bad that uh, they're just not compar comparable to other regions in the world. And so perhaps that's what it is. So then we also had in the data set from Nielsen um, how consumers use the internet and social media to inform the purchases that they make. And so through that, we actually found also another interesting um, correlation. First thing that we found is that the more internet penetration there is in a country, the more favorable it is to have a free press. And going further, we found that the countries that have the worst press freedom actually were more likely to use social media and internet reviews when they're making decisions about what to purchase. So to extrapolate that a little bit, you can say that perhaps people really want the truth and honest information from, you know, about their economy. And so if they can't get that from their press, then they will turn to social media and the internet to get it. And so just in conclusion, um, we thought that this quote by Thomas Jefferson was really apt. So information is the currency of democracy. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks. Well done. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, one, just in terms of um, implications for everyone assembled here, what do you think some of the conclusions you've reached and the way you've presented them, um, how, how will people here act upon those? Do you want to take that? Well, I think there's two main ones. One is more, I guess, in terms of methodology. Uh, I think one. Uh, conclusion is that as we look at the data, it's important to really look at more than just descriptive information, um, more than just what you would be looking at uh, on a, on a uh, dashboard in a company, uh, for example. So the idea is to look at um, models and try to fit different models to the data that you have. And uh, as you keep digging, they'll explain more and more about the phenomenon. And the second uh, conclusion, I think, is really about the internet and the importance of the internet and social media in, in, in different uh, countries today. Um, there's been several discussions earlier, um, and it was very interesting that, th that the theme sort of emerged early in the morning, um, that, that, that the internet is, is, a, is a powerful um, tool. And you know, as an example, um, countries like Russia, countries like China, um, countries like Iran, perhaps, uh, continue to suppress that. And uh, my own country, Ukraine, uh, starts to do that more and more. And it's a very troubling um, phenomenon to me. And I, I, I really hope, it's not really a prediction as, as, as much as hope, that in 2013, um, this becomes so much of an issue that um, the, the countries are, are very restricted in their ability to do so, so, th so that the governments can actually not, not control that to the extent that they control that today. Right. And then I'd like to make a prediction about data visualization. So I think one of the things that's going to happen in 2013 is that data visualization will no longer just be about infographics. I think that in the, few, in the past, it's kind of been that's been the way you get a set of numbers and then someone, a designer, makes it beautiful. And while that's very helpful, I think that the next step is going to be giving meaning and context and depth to data and telling a story. And I think that um, you know, our submission, we're, we were able to do that with our backgrounds. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that we learned through this process is, is making sure that the, that the data is set free, in a sense, and that lots of people have access to that and are able to build on the different ideas. I think there's, uh, you, know, you saw the results here um, uh, this afternoon. It's very, very powerful. One last question for you guys before we wrap up. Um, Bogdan, you're a, you're a PhD, a researcher and a professor uh, in uh, human resource development at Rochester Institute of Technology. And Stephanie, you're a journalist uh, reporting on healthcare policy in DC. 
Um, how did you use your, uh, your skills together to come up with uh, what we saw this afternoon? So I'm the freedom of the press nerd. <laughs> okay. And so when I looked at the data, the first thing I saw was China, UAE, and some other countries that I knew didn't have democracy, didn't have the free press, were very confident. And when you also look at the unemployment in those countries, they're not that great either. So that's where we got the freedom of the press thing. But I'll let Bogdan talk about it. Yeah, well, I guess my, my interest was always more in the data side of it and, and trying to uh, see how you can work with the data set. And um, uh, this one, um, I was actually working on multi-level models at, at, at work. And this one, albeit a small data set, and there's probably problems in that, but uh, it, it allows you to actually take the different levels of data, so not just countries, but also look at the regions and, and, and explain the variance and the outcome looking at both of those different, uh, both of those layers, so, so, so to speak. And I think, you know, now it, as we focus more and more on big, big data, um, that's a very imp important tool to consider because it allows you, again, to um, get a better picture. Great. Well, I think you'll all agree that Stephanie and Bogdan are a very powerful combination. And I'd appreciate it if you put your hands together and thank and congratulate.